Welcome to the Creators here at Sum City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos by making, making what you make. Today on The Creators, jazz musician Chris Claxton breaks out the keyboards, trumpet, and guitar, improvising in our studio as he leads a resurgence of live jazz in an already energized jazz community. Improvisation inspires improvisation. So subscribe to our channel, comment, and most importantly, watch Building With Us as we build community with you. Welcome back to The Creators, coming to you from Sum City Studios in beautiful downtown Somersworth, New Hampshire. I'm Tom Jackson, and uh, once again, I've commandeered the most comfortable chair in the house. Today on The Creators, uh, we are so excited to have uh, a very special guest with us, um, multi-talented musician, uh, jazz aficionado, and all-around great guy, uh, Chris Claxton. Welcome to uh, The Creators, Chris. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. And, you know, I've, I've been a, a fan uh, for quite some time, and so uh, it was really great to find out that we could get you to come to the studio and uh, talk with us about your life in music um, and, uh, and also uh, play a little bit of music for us. Um, so let, let's kick it off, first of all, um, You've you've got a number of uh, instruments that you brought in to play today. Uh, how many instruments do you you know really know how to play? Um, really know how to play. Probably trumpet, and I'd say trumpet and piano. Uh, I started taking piano lessons when I was eight years old. Um, so that was the first thing I put my hands on, and I started trumpet when I was ten. But I took lessons for trumpet and went to college a couple times for trumpet. I still feel like the trumpet always wins. Yeah. But that, that's the instrument that I feel like I have things to say about and I, I teach um, through the college level. But um, I've kind of always had a guitar kicking around which I, I can get around on but I just can't really, I wouldn't feel comfortable teaching and like I use that with very selected circumstances. You know, I don't have the facility of a jazz guitarist or that Rolodex of shapes and chords. And um, same thing with the bass. You know, I can get a decent sound and feel on a on a bass, but I I'd last about three minutes on a on a gig. You know, well, you do have a, a Rolodex of um, at least styles. You know, where you've connected with musicians uh, all over the place and, yeah. and played on a, a number of different uh, records and played live. Um, but I know that jazz has really been central for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, who, talk about your, uh, your early influences. What, what led you to, uh, to start getting involved, uh, learning about and playing jazz? Yeah. It's not a particularly glamorous story. It's, it's, I think it's the case. I share this in common with probably a lot of people my age. It was the school system. My, my parents uh, love music. But they weren't necessarily jazz fans specifically or audiophiles in that sense. But they love music, and I was raised with a, a real appreciation for sound and, and music of all kinds. But when I got into middle school, the band program where I grew up was just really phenomenal. So as a sixth grader, I joined the jazz band and learned how to improvise. And the teacher wasn't just... the I had, Two teachers, middle school and high school, Ken Clark and Tony DeBartolomeo. I went to Timberlane High School, not too far from here in, in Plastown, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And they, they gave us an education that I'd say was like rivals some college music departments. Wow. They're really serious about the fundamentals. Uh, the music they ask you to play is not, was not really like childish show music. It was right from the... The, ja the history of the jazz music, the jazz music, the, the history of the, the music. And, and in a concert band, it was like legitimate stuff as well. So they were turning us on to all sorts of like real historic sounds. And furthermore, they were bringing us out of the school to go check out concerts. And so those teachers introduced me to Clark Terry, the 
fam well-known trumpet player who had an uh, affiliation with UNH. And through meeting Clark Terry in high school and getting to hang out with him a bit, I think that was one of my main draws towards UNH as a school. So I did my undergrad there and really got to know Clark Terry during those, those years, made a ton of friends and all my roommates, we all played jazz music together. So that was a pretty serious age of becoming. I was at UNH down the road in Durham. Chris, um, Chris Claxton is our guest today, and uh, one of the things that I've noticed that I think is really cool uh, that you have been doing for a number of years now is trying to to promote um, jazz music in the Seacoast area, and and particularly getting people out to see live jazz. And I know you've done that at the dance hall a number of times. And uh, what are some of the other venues and you know, but, but I guess first, what what inspired you to uh, to want to you know really promote uh, jazz music in this area of the country? Well, part of that answer is I mean it's a little self-serving and selfish, right? It's my only skill set. <laughs> um, so wherever I'd live, that's what I'd, I'd want to do. But I, I discovered jazz in this area, right? So even though being a jazz musician in in a smaller location, right? It has its challenges, but I decided to do it in the first place because I learned that it was a thing here. I grew up not far away, but when I went to the University of New Hampshire near in the Seacoast area, uh, one of the first things I learned about was the press room in Portsmouth. And some of the finest music I've ever seen was there, either with guest artists or with our our area musicians, people that live here. Um, those were some of the first opportunities to have my mind blown. And then to to notice how close that was, to become friends with those musicians, and for the press room uh, to become a like a social hub, and for that to merge with my my training at that age as a 20, 21 year old and it just inspired me to to think that if it was already happening here I could at, at the very least hopefully add to it. And uh, the climate has changed a bit since then. You know the the press room will be coming back shortly but places we used to play we don't any longer or they don't exist. You know it's always somewhat of a struggle trying to package jazz music and present it in such a way that works for jazz fans and people who've never heard jazz or think they might not like it. You know, it's always a, a bit of an art form in itself, just trying to package the thing. Um, so, but despite the challenges, this is where I discovered the music. So I, I'm like bound and determined to, to keep doing it here, you know? Going back to, you know, you were saying you saw a lot of the the jazz musicians who were playing out, you know, at the press room and maybe some other places in the area. And, of course, you were, as you said, 20, 21 years old. And a lot of those musicians were, you know, kind of from maybe my generation, uh, mm -hmm. Gen X or, or from uh, uh, baby boomers or what have you. So now you've kind of 
picked up the gauntlet and, and you're trying to, to promote jazz music and your own work uh, in the area, what, what do you see in terms of uh, it's, it's the millennial generation? How are they responding? Uh, are they interested in jazz or do they just kind of think, uh, you know, whatever, that's, that's for somebody else? Um, I, I think like a lot of other uh, points of, of interest or concern in the social climate, I'm, I'm noticed as a teacher who's largely around uh, students between the ages of 17 and 23, 24, I see kind of polar things happening. You know, on one hand, the level of skills and ability to play an instrument, um, academic clarity, the ability to to think like mathematically and work things out. Like I'm just noticing a very high level of student in that in that way. And I'm also noticing that due to the economic shifts in our in our world in the past 10, 15 years or so, the DIY concept that that's always been there. I mean, it's always been in music forever, but especially in the latter half of the 20th century, if you want to be a musician, you've got to get used to doing it yourself. Write the music yourself, book it yourself, design your own album covers, right? So I'm noticing a lot of really uh, amazing examples of uh, young adults, students at the various schools that I teach, who are really excellent at that. They formed community, they take the bull by the horns, they book their own gigs, they write their own music, and they're technically quite proficient. On the other hand, I notice a lot of students who don't have a sound background in their instrument. Um, I notice a lot of in, uh, instrumentalists and, and singers, uh, students who, are, who have elected to be music majors who either don't know much about the history at all, which you can't always fault them, and some of them don't care, you know, because now that we're uh, saturated with so much new music, much of which is amazing, but now that there's so much new music, uh, artists their own age in their young 20s and very, very current contemporary artists, they're so flooded with their music that that's kind of where they're at yeah. stylistically. The music can be so interesting and so easy to come by that it can trick you into thinking that's all there is. So I guess my job is to try to encourage them to be new and modern and as weird as, as, weird as they'd like to be, <laughs> to form their own cliques, to have that DIY culture mentality. But, you know, without people, I keep coming back to Clark Terry because he was my, my giant, you know. But without people like him, without jazz musicians in our area, you mentioned jazz musicians who inspired me when I was 20 years old, they were likely in their 40s or 50s, without them, right? Without the lives they lived, the gigs they played, and their way of looking at the music and learning the tradition, we've got nothing. And there's been so many good examples of uh, great musicians who've had access to the giants, or still do, that bring all of that wisdom and knowledge here. So I think I'm adamant about having some sort of traditional tether, just because it's available. You know, we're not yet in an era where it's totally extinct. And in our area, there are people to access things to learn about the, the nature and the origin of our music. Um, I think those lessons, despite what a person's aesthetic is or what they want to do in their career, those lessons only serve to ground you and, and uh, to, bro to broaden, but also solidify like the tribe, you know, like we are in fact playing. We, there is a sense in which we are speaking the same language and we want to keep that language preserved no matter how it grows on the fringes. Yeah, and I think that's true in any art form. I mean, you know, I teach a couple of film-related classes at, uh, at UNH, and uh, I see the same kind of spectrum uh, among students, you know, and there are some who they don't know that much about the history of documentary filmmaking and, uh, or even, you know, who some of the, the giants are, never mind, you know, uh, 
an important but relatively obscure filmmaker like Ross McElway or somebody like that. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I consider it part of my job to introduce them to those people. Right. And they, they go from there. Uh, some of them really embrace it and think it's incredible and cool, and they understand that whole sort of following a tradition and, and bringing along it with your own innovations, of course, uh, to an extent. But, uh, you know, they see the value in, in knowing the, uh, the history of where we came from and, you know. Yeah. I actually have a pretty, I mean, I think most people do nowadays, but I have a pretty solid history with film. I think that's probably the thing that I liked movies as a two or three year old, right, before I knew anything about musicians or yeah. that history. But film can sometimes be a great way for me to teach a, um, a mature student. You know, if, if not that the student would be resistant in this case, but if the student is somewhat pigeonholed stylistically or they're so thoroughly modern they can't see anything that came prior, um, we often, in, in like private lessons or classes, I've often brought up films um, because that's, that's something we all have kind of a direct access and memory to. And even these millennial students were brought up on films of Absolutely. the 80s, 70s, 60s. So they can kind of see merit in tradition and older substance yeah. through film and then start to apply it to music. Oh, I guess I should. If I liked all the movies in that era, I should probably check out the music too, you know? Have you ever showed them uh, uh, documentaries about musicians? For example, Let's Get Lost about Chet Baker or uh, Straight Note Chaser about Thelonious Monk? I recommend them. Yeah. When I worked with younger students a lot, um, like high school and younger, then I'd take the opportunity to set up the TV or the VCR or the DVD player and play things for them. But in the college environment, I don't often, you know, those, sad to say, but it's not like I have a TV in my room or every room, so I, I rarely get the chance to share that experience with the student, yeah. but uh, I highly recommend those things. For a lot of my kids that are into composition and are starting to learn how to frame musical ideas and how much noise is too much noise, right? I, I, I'm a pretty big Bergman buff, so I try to turn them on to Ingmar and uh, even some new new directors like Wes Anderson, things that I think they'd like or they'd have experience with, just directors that have decided approaches and um, what's the word a brand, you know how do they, how much light do they use? How do they use angles? How yeah. how much how much motion? How much stillness? And for some reason, that's really easy to access because we grew up around movies. We can speak that language easier than the language where studying or devoting our life to, you know, film has such a universal uh, appeal, you know, it can really yeah. open people's eyes up. That's a good point. Yeah. So we're talking today on The Creators with musician Chris Claxton, and um, he's told us that uh, we are going to get a real treat in terms of um, a little bit of uh, improv music, and so could we... Uh, treat. Could we maybe heavy language there. A little of that now? Yeah. Sure. <laughs>
On the show, we always talk with various types of creators and um, usually have them talk about the creative process. You know, everybody's somewhat different. And we have people who are like, yeah, I, I dream songs, or there's some people who are very disciplined about sitting down and making the, themselves right, others it just comes to them. Um, how about your creative process? Yeah, the, the D word. And discipline is definitely um, something I'm always working on. I would like to be at a place soon where I write a, a piece of music every day, or I, I sit down for writing time every day. And now it's not that consistent. I write a couple times a week, and I write four projects that are coming up, you know, a deadline and a purpose with a certain band or instrumentation always generates some new things. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think those that sit down in a corner of their house or office to, to write something every single day, those are the folks that are known for their compositions, are known for their work. It requires a, a daily commitment. And um, there have been times in my life when I'm there, but I'm working towards it again. Uh, lately, I'd, I've done a lot of very per project writing. Got a gig coming up in X number of weeks or days and try to write some original music for that. Or I just did an arranging project for strings for a hip hop concert in Cambridge and that took up a lot of time. But um, while I want to work towards the discipline to sit down and write for writing's sake, this little ebb and flow balance is working for me mm -hmm. right now. Because sometimes I'm not a dream dream up a song and wake up and write it type of person. Yeah. But I, the shower thoughts and the things you sing in your car and to your phone, those are all extremely valuable. And I spend a lot of my time reapproaching my little notes. Well, I wondered also if your if your uh, domestic life might be able to uh, kind of lend itself to a little more of that discipline if you're trying to, because uh, I understand you're engaged to uh, a, uh, a jazz singer and yes. uh, musician as well. Indeed. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, possible, uh, well, past and possible future work uh, with Taylor. Well, um, we, we met through music. We met at the University of Miami in 2010. And uh, we got together and about a year later. So we, we studied a lot of music together. We made a lot of musical friends, and we, we, before we were an item, we were bandmates and uh, discovering and negotiating things like that already. And soon, like immediately after we finished getting a master's degree, we got a job together working in a jazz quartet of our very best friends 
on a cruise ship for six months. So Taylor and I immediately went from school and a relatively new relationship to sharing a room that was eight feet by five feet and <laughs> um, playing music together every night for like five or six hours. So we really tested it in the furnace before we even moved back to this area together. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there are many things, most things, where I think Taylor's the person I'd want to play with most often. Um, but then, of course, there are things that just are outside of each other's purview. You know, I, there are a lot of things that I do that are specific enough and have to do more with my history where it doesn't make sense to do everything with Taylor, and that definitely applies to some of the music that she does. You know, it's not always appropriate to have Chris there. Mm -hmm. But since we've known each other, we've played gigs as duos together a lot. We formed a lot of different bands to play with other friends and so and we're on faculty at some schools together so we get to do faculty concerts together so we're, we're never quite starved for the opportunity to play with each other but I th since it's something we can just do at the drop of a hat I think we're always searching for the the perfect thing we've played jazz we've played strum and sing stuff together so I think like right now we were just talking the other day about like what can we do together that would be maximally fun and something we've never done before or been asked to do before, you know? Because we have, like, musically we want to try new things, especially with each other, but uh, we also don't spend all of our time together as a couple uh, in musical ways. It's kind of a challenge, actually, for us both to get away from music and to just you know, watch a movie make a salad and eat it, go <laughs> camping, you know? <laughs> so we spend so much time in our respective cars teaching various students and in whatever bands we were in as individuals. When we get together, oftentimes music's the last thing we want of each other, you know? We want some normal people conversation, want to talk about our life away from music, making dinner. So, so that's a staple, as you might imagine. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like a very fertile musical relationship, but in the other hand, it's like sometimes we're trying to leave that at the door. You know? I get it. So we're going to hear some more music from Chris Claxton uh, right now, and then we will be back in a minute to talk a little bit more about uh, making a life out of being a creator. So a lot of artists of different types, musicians, writers, uh, even filmmakers, have talked about you know, how the, the internet age you know, and the digital age has affected them in one way or another. And for a lot of musicians, uh, I know that it has, it has had an adverse effect for some in terms of their ability to uh, you know, really stay completely focused on just making the music and then, and then trying to sell it like in the old days. Right. Um, how has that affected you? You've really kind of grown up with that, right. with that uh, platform available. Uh, do you feel like it's had an effect on you at all? You know, I was born in 1984. My family got the internet when I was in high school. Um, so it's all I've ever known. Um, there's a lot of clutter out there. There's a lot of great stuff. It's, it's really how I function. It's how I share my music. It's how I find new music. It's how I study old music. You know, there's so many beautiful resources out there. Like it's, I have to say it's been an overwhelming advantage. It has to be. But the, the pace, the speed of everything, the amount of crap, the clutter, 
um, yeah, just the speed at which it functions and coerces all of us to kind of participate, to jump in that stream and go at that pace, it's pretty counter to a creative lifestyle sometimes. Like you said, there's immediate access, so when I want a place to premiere music or will need to make a new friend or poach information from some corner of the internet, I can do that, I can do that immediately, and that's very good for business. But all those days and hours and weeks that we used to wait for letters and wait for the person to return your call is when we used to get a lot of work done. And now we're constantly in, in the process of communicating, and it's very difficult to find time to, to create. But similarly, I, I have no idea what I would do without it. I don't know how I'd reach the people I need to reach. It is not a, a money-making source for selling music. There's a, the market's too flooded for me to make money online selling music, but as a communication tool to share my work, to express who I am, the internet has found me, all, all clients, and all, uh, I teach a lot, you know, I'm, I'm on faculty at a few universities and Portsmouth Music Arts Center, so none of those jobs I would have ever even found in the first place or been able to share of myself if it were not for the the interwebs. I'm, I'm still learning. So we've been talking today with uh, Chris Claxton here on The Creators and uh, wondering if you would uh, do us the honor of uh, playing us out with one more song on uh, whatever instrument you want. Cool. Thanks so much, Chris, for coming on uh, the, the Creators. Thanks for having me. And uh, we will see you all next time here on the Creators, coming to you from Sun City Studios in beautiful downtown Summer.